Li Cheng is a professor of international relations at the University of Hong Kong, and he's recently returned to China after many years in the United States. So a close observer of the Chinese-US relationship. Professor Li, thanks very much for talking to DW here at the Munich Security Conference. Let's start by talking about China's position here at the conference. Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, was here this weekend. He was also here last year when he brought along the famous uh, Chinese position paper, so sometimes called a peace plan for, for dealing with the war in Ukraine. Um, now a year later, uh, he didn't have any new paper to bring. Nothing much has really moved in that conflict. What does that tell us about the state of this war? Well, the things uh, change, and particularly U.S.-China relation has changed. Because last year, that uh, when Wang Yi came, there was uh, just a brew incident, uh, the, the so-called spy brew incident. Later found out it's not a spy uh, in uh, the brew. Uh, well, well that's, that's debated and disputed no, still. The but. U.S. government said it's not a, brew, not a spy brew. This is not from the Chinese state, uh, government. So I think that uh, he is a much better mood and also that uh, China, uh, China's president and U.S. president just had a meeting uh, a few months ago in San Francisco. Not, it does not mean that U.S.-China relations is really uh, profoundly changed, but at least they found the floor to uh, discuss, so less confrontational. So that's one background. The second is certainly um, it's not so easy to resolve the Ukraine uh, uh, the war. I think China realized that, but of course the international community also realized that uh, uh, the, the difficulties at the moment. But on top of that, there's also uh, Israel-Hamas war going on. So certainly uh, the international atmosphere is also getting very, very negative. Uh, the position paper by uh, Munich Security Council certainly talk about lose-lose that reflects the atmosphere uh, in, in the moment. So lots to break down there, but let's talk first a little bit more about China's position um, on the Ukraine war. Um, because in that position paper, which I think is still considered to be kind of valid as describing China's position, you know, the very first point is that it says that China um, st believes that the territorial integrity and the sovereignty of every country has to be uh, respected. And Wang Yi referred to that again today with a clear reference to Ukraine, that Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity needs to be respected. So does that mean that China believes that its territorial integrity should be restored as part of any resolution to the war? Well, certainly from day one, China talked about the, the importance of sovereignty. And uh, also China maintained good relationship with Ukraine, despite that also China has a very good relation with Russia. So uh, that's uh, uh, the China's uh, uh, interesting position. That's also uh, from the beginning that China believes that they can play a positive role in terms of a uh, uh, negotiation table. But the whole thing turned out to be not that uh, 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 it's far more complicated than anyone can realize. But uh, in terms of emphasis of sovereignty, emphasize China's uh, uh, interest to see uh, peace rather than uh, continue a uh, war in uh, Russia and Ukraine. I think that's a position China has not changed. But I just want to pin you down, though, on this question of territorial integrity, because, of course, Russia has claimed that it has annexed now four Ukrainian regions, that they are now part of Russia. Uh, China has not recognized those claims. So would China then expect, as part of any resolution, that those four regions uh, would be returned to Ukraine? Well, but also, uh, in addition to China's position, but also China talk about the NATO expansion. They think that the NATO expansion is a part of the reason that uh, interpret uh, Russia's behavior. So we do need to see these two parts. On the one hand, China talk about sovereignty. China, in many ways, maintain a relationship with Ukraine. But at the same time, uh, China is not a, really a neutral in that position. Yeah. But, but, but may I just, uh, let's talk about NATO in a moment. But just to be specific, do you think that China would uh, expect Ukraine's territorial integrity to be restored for those regions, and presumably also Crimea, whose attachment to Russia has also not been recognized by China, would those be restored to Ukraine? Well, I, I, again, this is an extremely complicated issue. It depends on how you define the sovereignty, how you look at the history, because different people have different interpretations. Well, well it's not that complicated. I mean, the, the territorial boundaries of Ukraine uh, as a sovereign country uh, have been internationally recognized, including by China. Well, that's true, but also when China early on emphasized the point 
also make a, a point that Taiwan is a different issue. Taiwan is part of China. If you really acknowledge its sovereignty, the Western world also should uh, acknowledge China's, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, sovereign rights over Taiwan. This is China's position, where China come from. And, uh, but of course, the Western world uh, uh, it's, uh, do not necessarily uh, accept that. Yeah, but maybe we can come to Taiwan. But I'm still, I, I, I still haven't got a clear answer from you. I, I want to understand. Like the first point of the position paper is that the territorial integrity of all countries has to be respected. But you are not willing to say that that means that those uh, regions of Ukraine which have been supposedly annexed by Russia would be returned to Ukraine. Well, I, again, that uh, China's position. I'm not defending a Chinese position. I just try to interpret uh, what that really means. But at the moment, that uh, certainly China talk about the important sovereignty, uh, but uh, China does not uh, uh, blame Russia in that regard uh, publicly because they, the reason is they, they refuse to do that partly because they think that uh, you should go back to NATO expansion because uh, Russia's behavior. So that's the China's uh, package. And I cannot separate just only talk about one thing. But on the other hand, China is was sincere, hoping that they can resolve the problem. But in light of the current situation, we do not know whether this is the, uh, China's uh, position paper or China's uh, initiative and whether it really can work or not. We do not know yet. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm really just trying to understand China's position. So, okay, let's move on from territorial integrity to this question of uh, another point in the plan, which says that the legitimate security concerns of different countries have to be respected. And I think this is reference to Russia's complaints about NATO expansion. So do you believe that NATO expansion, or do you think China believes that NATO expansion should be reversed, that the new members of NATO should, uh, should now leave NATO? Well, I don't think that China can clearly make that statement. This will offend a lot of people. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I'm trying to understand. One thing that China is very clear, China opposed so-called the East Asia version of NATO, because you know, NATO now tried to establish an office in Japan and etc. So China deeply worry about what happened. It's also will move to East Asia. Yeah, yeah, yeah but that, that old office in Japan is not happening. The French blocked that. Um, but, but we're talking about NATO expansion in Europe. I, uh, of course, like, I'm sure the countries like Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania would not be delighted to be told by China that they should leave NATO. But I just want to understand if you think the expansion of NATO was the problem, then it, it, what would be China's desire? Like to see NATO unwound and just end or something? Well, I think that uh, uh, China is in a, a huge dilemma. On the one hand, China does not want to see Russia uh, completely defeated. Uh, because uh, uh, based on the current uh, Chinese understanding, the U.S. strategy already put China as the most formidable enemy. With uh, Russia is gone, the next one will, <laughs> will be China, will focus on China. This is explain China's uh, uh, strategic dilemma or China's strategic interest in that regard. But at the same time, uh, that uh, uh, in many ways that China also caught up in a terrible situation with the uh, 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 Russia-Ukraine war. China did not benefit from that because you can see the clear blocks that the U.S.-led coalition become very, very active. And China is on the other block. China is not willing to see that, that what has happened. But uh, in a way, the so-called authoritarianism with democracy unfolding in a way is against China's interest. So this is uh, uh, China's concern. But isn't it clear that China could actually, you know, help to bring about an end to this war pretty quickly if it just put pressure on Vladimir Putin? I mean, Russia is extremely dependent now on China. Uh, China has enormous leverage over Russia's actions. Well, I think you have a good, a good observation. But on the other hand, I mean, anyone can control Russia or influence Putin is always limited because China and Russia have to go together at this current moment. But of course, sadly, um, uh, in a way, sometimes what you want to achieve, China wants to maintain as a responsible member in the international community, not only just, uh, you know, so-called BRICS country, but uh, also with the G20, with APEC, and uh, with other countries. Any international organization that is not against China, China wants to be part of that. But unfortunately, now you can see China-Russia relation become closer and closer. But what's really the driving force, different people have different uh, uh, say. Chinese leaders think that we are pushed 
uh, in that direction. When Xi Jinping talk about uh, major power relations, he refer to United States, not to refer to Russia. And, um, and also Xi Jinping sent his daughter to, to Harvard, not to Russia, not to Moscow University. That speaks uh, loud about the, uh, you know, 12 years ago or 15 years ago. Yeah, that, that does speak volumes, doesn't it? But, um, but I just want to return to this question that, um, you know, if this war is causing such problems for China, um, and China can also see that, you know, essentially this is a major breach of sovereignty and territorial integrity, why doesn't it just say to Putin, sorry, you've got to stop this. We need the, the world to return to some stability. Well, I do not know uh, what they really discuss uh, uh, privately. And, um, uh, but the, the early on already explained China is in a huge dilemma uh, because on the one hand, uh, you look at the U.S. strategy uh, framework, we already identify China as the most formidable enemy. So now the, if Russia is completely defeated, uh, then the next one will be China. This is Chinese mindset. Uh, the, so that explains their hesitance. But uh, China uh, does not support militarily for Russia. They probably support uh, economically or in other channels. In many ways, China comply some of the, uh, the sanctions. I think that's probably uh, it's, it's quite real because at least the U.S. side not to blame, uh, complain too much in that regard. What do you think um, people in Beijing will be thinking about the death of Alexei Navalny? I mean, this has obviously really overshadowed the conference here. What, what, what goes through minds in Beijing when they see that? Well, uh, certainly, I think that uh, they also, uh, it depends on who you ask. And uh, uh, of course, this is uh, the timing of this uh, death and uh, uh, the tragic nature certainly got a lot of people's attention. And um, um, so, but on the other hand, it depends on who you ask, what the position, because uh, in terms of how you look at the Russia, how you look at Putin, Chinese society is very, very divided. Um, and just one last question relating to also Russia, Ukraine. Um, you know, Ukraine obviously would like to join NATO as part of any resolution at the end of this war. Obviously, that's going to be a major discussion point in negotiations. What would China's view on that be? Probably, I assume, taking from what you're saying, China would not like to see NATO get even bigger. Well, I think by the logic, just I mentioned, you can see that direction. But at the same time, it's not a... Uh, it will be unwise for China to make it very publicly. What China wanted to do is to maintain good relations with some EU countries. And because it's a partly it's a for economic reason, and China, and also for strategic reasons, China do not want to be isolated. So I think in, in many ways, China probably wish to see that the Russian-Ukraine will come to an end. Then uh, European country may have some other thoughts about uh, the so-called block thinking you know, to, to block authoritarianism and democracy. But on the other hand, the, the U.S. elections are to complicate the whole things, right? Because even without that factor, a lot of European countries deeply worry about Donald Trump's isolationism and et cetera. So that, uh, again, added the complicity. So if Chinese leadership is wise, they probably will be quiet. They will not say what they really wanted to do. Yeah, so let's look ahead to that election. Um, obviously, that's going to have a huge impact on, on U.S.-China relations. Um, you know, what is you know China's thinking? Do you feel on this choice, Biden Trump? Well, uh, for Biden, it's very much expected, and uh, uh, certainly China, under the Biden administration, U.S.-China relation has not really improved that much, and uh, so that tells you uh, two different parties, two different leaders. The policy toward China largely continuity. That's probably nothing to do with the individual leaders or nothing to do with the party, but more to do with the structure tensions. Meaning that uh, uh, the U.S. feels that China become a real threat because it's a comprehensive power, uh, uh, differ from the Cold War. Uh, the Soviet Union is only strong in military, but China is quite compatible, compatible in so many areas: militarily, technologically, economically. Uh, certainly. So that explains what I call the structure problem. And also U.S. domestic politics uh, make China a different political model or uh, political system, economic model, also more uh, sensitive to American public and uh, etc. So uh, in, in that regard, both parties try to be tough on China. So that was atmosphere. China cannot change that much. China should understand uh, that. But uh, Biden uh, is very much expected and uh, probably will uh, not be completely decoupling 
uh, Biden already abandoned that. And on the Taiwan policy, probably our continuation about the one China policy in principle will not push too hard uh, on that regard. But on the other hand, uh, by the improved relation with uh, you know, European countries, uh, uh, the so-called like-minded country, that uh, the way that unfold, it's not China's best interest. But for Trump, it's uh, really uncertain in many ways. On the one hand, uh, his isolationism, particularly regarding Taiwan, could be uh, very much in China's best interest. Uh, and uh, when he alienated the uh, uh, European uh, allies, uh, these countries probably will look at China in a different light. But on the other hand, the, we have to, uh, Chinese leadership also recognize the Rep Republican Party become very, very conservative or even more ideological. So it could be very, very tough uh, uh, toward China uh, with or without uh, Trump. But, but you feel, I mean, just to pick up out a couple of potential positives for, chi for China then from Trump would be potentially putting more space between the Europeans and the U.S.? Um, and then maybe backing off on Taiwan a little bit. I mean, where do you see the opportunities on Taiwan? No, I don't think uh, uh, Trump himself will, buy, will back Taiwan that much. That's no, no, I mean backing off on okay, Taiwan. Okay, backing off on Taiwan, yes. Yes, this is what China can say. But at the same time, uh, almost for sure that uh, 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 Trump will increase the tariff uh, in the trade relation with China. And uh, that's certainly, uh, it's not good news for China. But on the other hand, relatively speaking, trade issues is, is not as uh, important as security issue. Yeah. But do you feel, I mean, some speculate that Trump would actually really like to do a kind of a grand bargain with Xi Jinping, sit down like the, the two big leaders and work out some deal which may involve, you know, um, him like uh, limiting U.S. support for Taiwan in return for some major deal on trade. Do you think that is plausible? It, it, it is possible because there's a Chinese saying, if there's any problem could be resolved by money, it's not a big problem. This Chinese mindset, you, can, you know what I mean. But on the other hand, you do not know what the team Trump will form regarding policy towards China. If we go back to Michael Pompeo, Peter Novaro, uh, Steve Miller, Steve uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bannon, then it would be good, not a good picture. Um, you recently, just like we mentioned, moved to Hong Kong after decades, in fact, in the United States. Um, tell us about that move. How did that, like, what was the motivation there? And what are your impressions of, uh, of the state of the relationship between the U.S. and China overall? Well, uh, this is a more personal decision. It may or may not reflect many other things. But the one thing is that um, um, I, uh, my job uh, when I entered Brookings 17 years ago is try to be a bridge. Uh, to engagement, to people-to-people -people exchanges, think tank-to-think tank dialogue. Now, bec uh, still possible, become increasingly difficult. Uh, U.S. is not moved to uh, engage with China. We talk about decoupling, including educational, culture, even think tank uh, decoupling, and et cetera. You see the U.S. Congress bills and many other things reflect that. So I'm a little bit worried. Now, Hong Kong is, in many ways, it's unique. It's still uh, different from uh, mainland China. Uh, it's a cosmopolitan city, and uh, uh, there's uh, so, uh, so many foreigners than any, any or entire country combined in China. So that gives some opportunity to do some more engagement, more dialogue, and uh, formally or informally. Um, but I was recently in Beijing, actually, at a conference, and it's striking that virtually all of the conference delegates traveled there with burner phones, um, like not taking their own phones, but taking dummy phones that they had to use temporarily because they're so concerned about Chinese digital spying. Like that, that is the sort of risk that a lot of people just simply don't want to go in for anymore, including a lot of corporations. Well, that certainly was the, the atmosphere. It's a little bit, uh, uh, it's too excessive to be honest with you. I think anyway, Are you sure? Uh, well, we, I, I did that before, but the thing is, if modern technology, you do not need to bring anything. A lot of ways they can find out the communication and et cetera. It's not uniquely Chinese, I, I, I would say. No, I mean, I think they will live in a ter uh, terrible uh, period about the technology really so intrusive. This is almost everywhere. But it certainly had gave out some sort of digital Cold War vibes. I mean, just as a final question in your reflections personally, but also structurally, is this now a new kind of Cold War era? Well, in many ways, it's already, um, uh, it is. But at the same time, it will never be the same because the 40 years, China's openness, you create many generations 
they are very much internationally minded, and uh, Chinese actually can travel abroad, and uh, 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 so that's a big difference. So uh, this is also making me wonder uh, how different China between China and the Russia. Uh, in many ways, and uh, particularly the time when I grew up in China during the Cultural Revolution, during the Mao era, completely different. Because that time, probably the whole country just have several hundred visas. But now, I mean, uh, uh, there's no problem. You get a visa. Uh, there's uh, 100 million, 200 million people travel abroad. I mean, this kind of uh, activities. Uh, there's no, uh, very, very few or even none of them defected. So that tells you a lot about uh, the complicity of China. So sometimes uh, uh, our view is a little bit uh, uh, too excessive, uh, let me say, put that way. I, I do not deny some of the problems. I think the, the point, sadly, there are a lot of uh, challenges about the civil society. That's a, that's a fact. But at the same time, I just do not want to give you kind of a situation. I think China needs to deal with that more open, uh, let, uh, let more foreigners visit China, particularly encourage student exchanges. I mean, Xi Jinping made a commitment in uh, San Francisco. China will attract uh, uh, 50,000 uh, Americans in the five, next five years. If you have this kind of excessive situation, how can you attract so many American students? I think that uh, it's a problem it's itself. It will be a testament for China, whether China can open or will uh, still perceive as, uh, as now. Li Cheng, thanks for talking to DW today. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you.